If you've consumed any media in the last 70 years, there's a good chance you've heard this voice. This sound, man being eaten by alligator, was recorded for Distant Drums in 1951 for a scene where a guy randomly drowns all by himself. This recording then became part of the library of sound effects people at Super Warneo Brothers used. Another scream from that recording then appeared in 1953's The Charge at Feather River, where a certain Private Wilhelm gets shot by an arrow. They also use it like two more times in the same movie. Sound designer Ben Burt noticed this reuse and started reusing it himself in student films because he thought it was funny. As a silly little joke, he hid it in the background of a B-movie he was hired to work on. Oops, looks like culture's been changed forever! Burt had accidentally started a career-long running joke. In his big cameo in Jedi, he does an impression of the scream when he gets killed by an OSHA-violating guardrail. <laughs> then other people started using it too, and now it's everywhere. <laughs> Getting in on someone else's in-joke kind of risks ruining it, but I wouldn't know anything about that. And there's a bunch of other iconic screams like this. Oh Jesus Christ! Like with Wilhelm, the source of these sounds are usually well documented. That scream comes from a popular sound effects library. And while we're ruining things, those sheep slash goats screaming like a human videos you love so much? Yeah, they're all fake. That's just a sound that comes free with Apple software. <coughs> You're welcome. But for over a decade, one sound's original source was unknown. This one. <coughs> this is all over internet video nowadays, but where's it from? Most people under a certain age are yelling Roblox at the screen right now. Roblox is a free online game slash platform people can make additional content and games for, and they can even monetize what they make for a, a pittance. According to YouTube journalists People Make Games, Roblox developers receive less than 25% of the money from sales of content they make. This has led to the Roblox Corporation attaining a net worth of roughly seven quads billion dollars. And one of, if not the, most iconic things about this game is its death sound effect, also known as the Roblox oof. Videos of just this sound get millions upon millions of views. It has its own separate existence as a meme across thousands of videos, and one video claiming to be its origin has 117 million views, shockingly close to the lifetime views of my entire channel. Oh. This sound effect is a phenomenon, but it's not from Roblox, and this child is a liar. Mm. <laughs> Now, I, <coughs> I haven't played Roblox. I play mature games for grown-ups, like Fortnite. Oh! When I was the age Roblox would have definitely controlled my life, it was instead being controlled by stop-motion animation, and then later by Gary's Mod, a game which did not monetize its content in increasingly horrifying ways, transforming its community into a digital sweatshop, but I'm sure the new way is fine too. So no, I haven't played Roblox, but I have played Messiah. Messiah was released in the year 2000 and developed by Shiny Entertainment. They made Path of Neo, so they're insane and I love them. You play as a cute little cherub named Bob who gets blasted down to earth to help out. This is the best opening cutscene ever. Bob has no combat abilities whatsoever. Instead though, he can possess other people. I'm a cop. You know, in real life, a huge portion of the angels who come to Earth end up in the bodies of police officers. It's true, Google 40% cops. Bob can possess basically any living thing, including rats when the developers feel like making you save scum. The player is constantly switching bodies, using their different abilities, credentials, and weapons. The pacing is breakneck, because doing so doesn't slow you down. I played Messiah in the mid-2000s when I found it in a Christian charity shop. I assume they didn't see the words sex, religion, possession, death on the cover. And then I threw it away. I bought this copy on eBay to use as a prop. I have to get this out for the rest of the video now. Then a decade passes, and in a random YouTube video, I hear a familiar sound. Ooh. 
People tell me it's from Roblox, but I swear I've heard it somewhere else. Obviously, I immediately forgot about it and moved on with my life until 2019 when someone else figured it out. User Plasmanode on Reddit was watching the ending cinematic on YouTube for some reason and noticed a very familiar sound. <coughs> He posted his discovery on Reddit along with a clip from the ending. Someone stole and reposted his clip on Twitter. A large Roblox YouTuber made a video about that tweet, and then journalists started picking up on it. Although the articles do credit the wrong person with the discovery, because their one source is a video that got it wrong. Why did the sound get so popular anyway? Well, if TV has taught me anything, Children being injured is just universally funny. Let's not think about what that says about us. Here's an interesting fact, which I hope justifies me playing the entire game in preparation for this video. Everyone involved seems to think the sound effect is specifically in the ending, but it's actually all over the game. You can fly around and flap your little wings to float, and whenever you slam into a wall, Bob makes a noise, and that's one of the noises. It's also in the opening cutscene, too. What? It's kind of funny it was discovered in the ending, the last possible place you would hear it if you played the game. Interestingly enough, there was proof in Roblox the sound was from Messiah all along, and no one thought to check. You see, sound files have this thing in them called metadata. It's extra information that comes with a file, you know, album art, list of the artists and people who worked on it, and so on. You know those pirated Weird Al Yankovic albums your friend gave you when you were 14? Uh, that's why the album art was in there. It was in the metadata. I think that anecdote might be a bit too specific. The oof sound in Roblox's game files, er.wav, uh, has metadata in it saying it was made in 1999, while Messiah was being made, with the engineer listed as Joe Joey Kouros. Joey Kouros is an extremely prolific video game sound designer. He's worked on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Spider-Man, Gears of War, and even Fortnite. That clip I showed earlier, that wasn't just me showing off my sick skills. That was a clever setup for this bit. No, it wasn't actually. I wrote a Fortnite joke and then it turned out he'd worked on Fortnite, but still. And here's Joey on page XXXVI of Messiah's Manual as one of the sound effects guys. S see, look, see? I don't have a camera person this time, so I'll have to cut to a close-up that I shot later. Uh, Rachel stopped responding when she found out what the video was about. So there we go. We know where the sound effect was from. We even have a good idea who might have made it. Mystery solved. We can all go home to our families. Just kidding, there's more. That's only the beginning of the story, you worm. <laughs> I can't say can't say that. We haven't even talked about who owns the sound effect yet. It doesn't belong to Joey, it belongs to the company he was working for when it was made, Tommy Tallarico Studios, along with its owner, Tommy T I don't need to say his name, it, 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 he named his studio after himself. Are you, are you, are you ready? Tommy Tallarico is a veritable video game industry icon, according to the first line of his biography on his website. I wouldn't personally go that far, but he was a fairly well-known musician and composer for video games in the 90s and 2000s. His most notable soundtracks include Earthworm Jim, MDK, and Advent Rising. His company was involved with the sound effects on lots of other games from this period too. That's why if you're my age or older, this is burned into your brain. Tommy Tellerico Studios. He was also on TV on the shows Electric Playground and Judgment Day, some of the earliest shows about video games, reviewing new releases and interviewing developers. If you were around for a certain era of game history, you remember Tommy from TV or played something his company worked on. He also co-founded Video Games Live, which produced symphony performances of popular video game soundtracks. VGL is universally recognized among gamers as a thing they think they remember hearing about that seems nice. Through royalties from his company's work over the years, Tommy's doing pretty well for himself, and he's spent his money on living in a very interesting house. It has themed rooms, a Spider-Man room full of all the original comics. Probably have about $50,000 in your hands right there. Giant statues of Lara Croft and the Fifth Element Lady. An ancient Egypt themed dining room? The list goes on. The first thing I, I built in my house when I bought this was a seven foot waterfall. But it, it kind of sucks because at night sometimes I, I have to go to the bathroom. And Tommy is proud of his insane mansion, that's why I've got so much footage of it. He's given numerous tours of the place over the years, and it was even on MTV's Cribs. He's so proud of that, he re-uploaded it to his own YouTube channel years later. He's very happy about the fact he was specifically on MTV's Cribs. He says it a lot in interviews, and that's what he calls the video he uploaded onto his own channel. And there's no way he would tell an obvious lie like that. Would he? 
Foreshadowing is a literary device in which he also re-uploaded an old UK show where the presenter clearly hates his house. This is yeah. absolutely hideous. You've got to sort yourself out, Tommy. You've got too much money. <laughs> this is silly. It's not right, Tommy. It? No, but it is. There's children it's starving. And if you're the sort of person who's impressed by Guinness World Records, Tommy has a huge stack of them leaning up against a cabinet in the corner of his awards slash Indiana Jones nook. The big one is person who has worked on the most video games in their lifetime. I actually have the Guinness World Record for the person who's worked on the most video games in their lifetime. He's such a big deal, he was handpicked by Shigeru Miyamoto to work on Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime with Shigeru Miyamoto, I worked with him for uh, many years. And he was also the first American to work on the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise. I was the first American ever hired uh, to work on the Sonic franchise. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Do you really believe that? Tommy's been kind of resting on his laurels doing video games live for a while now. He hasn't done much new music for games since the late 2000s. One of the last things he did was donate music to Super Tofu Boy, a game made by Peter. It's a really bad Super Meat Boy clone interspersed with quite good music and interesting meat facts. Listen, Peter, I've eaten a lot of tofu, but meat doesn't scream either. If it did, people would probably stop eating it. Tommy is a vocal Peter supporter, doing an interview for them in the Egyptian wing of his house about cruelty to animals and put out a statement on Facebook responding to criticism of his involvement with Tofu Boy. It's the only press release I've ever read that has emoticons in it. <laughs> We can't really talk about Tommy without talking about what he was doing while the oof was being discovered. Tommy is most well known nowadays for what has become known as the Amico disaster. In 2018, Tommy acquired the rights to Intellivision, a game company from the 70s and 80s, and announced he was making a brand new console, the Intellivision Amico. Amico aimed to be a truly family-friendly games console, with low age ratings on its games, and the bonus selling point of, uh, not having online play. Apparently to get people playing in the same room together? Together again. Oh. Some people would tell you online play is one of the best features of modern gaming and a nice option for people who can't easily be physically next to each other. And to that, Tommy's reply was, no. When I was growing up in the 70s, 80s, and even when I was working in the game industries in the 90s, you know, we didn't have the internet, right? With this pitch in hand, how did the Amico do? It didn't. It was delayed, supposedly due to the global pandemic, but then it was delayed many more times and it still isn't out two years after the intended launch. It seems less like unfortunate supply chain issues and more like management underestimated how hard it is to make a new game console from scratch. As CEO, Tommy made the decision to open two company offices in Irvine, California and Salt Lake City, Utah, two really expensive places to open offices in the middle of the pandemic. In his video tours, the large expensive spaces are mostly empty and unused, with the money guy in the back looking like he's working overtime trying to keep this operation afloat without a finished product. This is where the magic is. <laughs> Tommy wants money. This is, this is, in this box is where it all happens. As the money started to run out, they turned to crowdfunding investment website Fig. Tommy produced a video in his Spider-Man room, with other company leadership in his Egypt room and Tomb Raider themed movie theater room, claiming the console just needs a bit more money to get going and releases just around the corner. The rocket ship has been built, we are on the launch pad, and we just need the fuel to take off. So strap yourself in, because it's gonna be one hell of a ride. They raised seven million more dollars and the Amico still didn't come out. So they tried again, turning to second crowdfunding investment website, Republic. They even used the same pitch video. Come on guys, the rocket ship just needs a couple more million dollars. Strap yourself in. They raised over 11 and a half million more dollars so they could continue to not release a console. They tried a third time on a weird shady investor website that pretends to be a live stream but is clearly pre-recorded. The rocket ship is built, folks. We are on the launch pad, we just need a little more fuel. And then they turned to yet another crowdfunding website for more and cancelled it partway through when it became clear there's no one left to invest. When internal documents leaked revealing the console's internal hardware was cheap, old, and rubbish, Tommy threatened people who reported on it with legal action, and when another journalist asked what the reporters had done wrong reporting publicly available information, he deleted all the tweets. The Amico's difficult non-launch, gleeful tossing of investor money into two large holes, there's not too many people here in the office uh, yet.
react. And its CEO's increasingly aggressive behavior towards people trying to report what was happening netted the company and Tommy some criticisms. Tommy did the responsible thing and started messaging people to call them names. He defended the Amico on internet forums, calling detractors morons, idiots, mentally unstable, narcissists, and cowards, comparing criticism of his business decisions to racism, eventually settling on calling his detractors gaming racists, the funniest term I've ever heard. But these elitists, the racists, they're literally gaming racists. He did this while following a bunch of actual racists, white supremacists, and far-right personalities on Twitter. This caused people to check for his other hot takes and discover his opinion on people who kneel for the national anthem. Apparently racism is bad, but protesting it is for douchebags. Uh, if somebody just said, I sound like a social justice warrior, uh, you couldn't be farther from the truth. And I'm the most unpolitically correct person on the planet. Don't call me an SJW. You have no idea how racist I- People are saying I got triggered? No, I'm just having fun and being passionate. The folks in there that are, that are, that are peeing their pants right now. Things just got worse from there. It hit the point where Tommy, the CEO of a family-friendly games console company in desperate need of investment, would only give interviews with an ever-dwindling group of die-hard fans who completely agreed with this behavior. The kind of normal person who wear a serial killer mask while they interview you. My wife told me to cancel my Amico. And I still did not. This is one of the last people Tommy was willing to speak to. And then if you want to hear me, um, uh, pwn some noobs and, um, and, and punch back at some haters, follow me on Twitter, Tommy Tellerico. And, uh, you know, I don't mind punching back to some of these losers. So. He has since stepped down as CEO with his replacement announcing the company is entering a quiet period, which is a hell of a subtweet if I've ever seen one. The Amico still isn't out and a lot of people want their money back. In the middle of all this, right before the first big delay, before things got super bad, back when Tommy had a reputation to burn, the oof discovery was made. Due to his contract with Shiny Entertainment, Tommy Tallarico Studios owns all the sound effects he and his employees made for the game. Shiny could use them in Messiah, but they belong to Tommy, and he can use them again or sell them if he wishes. And when Tommy found out a sound effect he owned was being used in Roblox, oh boy, did the butter begin to churn. Tommy stepped up to the plate and did a stream on YouTube called Talking About the Roblox Oof Sound and Controversy. It's hard going back to this stream because he spends a good chunk of it pitching a soon-to-be released game console that still doesn't exist. We're actually coming out with a brand new video game machine. It's called the Intellivision Amico. We actually don't allow online play. It's weirdly anxiety inducing watching a man in January 2020, right before a global pandemic, pitching a console whose central feature is trapping people in a room together. Everybody can kind of come together and play in the same room together. But when he wasn't pitching his scam adjacent business venture, Tommy was demanding Roblox give him $100 million. Tommy wants money. Okay, for legal reasons, I'd like to specify that was a joke. He didn't ask for that much. Probably. He didn't say how much he wanted almost like he was embarrassed to. Tommy made it clear he didn't want Roblox to remove the sound. He wanted them to keep using it, but to pay him for it. And if they didn't, things were going to court. They may think that, um, you know, I'm trying to get the sound taken out of the game. I'm not. They may think that I'm currently suing Roblox. I'm not currently, but it's also not fair to me that I don't get compensated for, for this. This situation is, legally speaking, very funny. Allow me to pretend I understand it for a few minutes. A key point here is, at least as far as I can tell, so probably wrong, Tommy isn't owed any compensation. According to Roblox, the oof came on a CD of sound effects the original creators purchased when they were making the game in the mid-2000s. If this is true, they used the sound with the reasonable belief they had the right to do so at the time. Whoever took the sound out of Messiah and sold it on a CD could be in trouble, but the two guys who started Roblox in 2006 didn't do anything wrong, apart from create Roblox. 
Okay, I've spoken to a couple of lawyers after filming this bit, should have done beforehand really, and they clarified something I think I should add here about them not doing anything wrong. They did still technically do copyright infringement. If you use a sound effect you bought from someone and it turns out they stole it and lied to you, you're still guilty of copyright infringement. However, if this actually went to court, there is something called the innocent infringer defense. If an infringer can demonstrate they had no reason to believe they had committed copyright infringement, and it looks like Roblox might be able to do that, the court can reduce the the statutory damages to as low as $200 per infringement. There are other types of damages, like actual damages, the losses suffered by the owner as a result of the infringement, but that's something that could only be answered in a courtroom. As you're about to see, however, Roblox directly told Tommy they don't think they owe him anything. So it sounds like they think they have a good defense if things go to court. In these tweets a few days before the stream, Tommy seems a bit annoyed that no one owes him money. Although in his version, Roblox feel like they don't owe him anything which is a strange way of describing a large corporation. I think what Tommy means is Roblox's lawyers know what the law is, but he still would like to have some money. All Roblox are required to do in this situation is remove the sound. And Tommy could send a cease and desist and trigger that happening whenever he wanted. I could have sent a letter very easy, cease and desist, stop using the sound, it's mine, you don't have permission to use it, take it out of your game. But Tommy isn't doing that because he doesn't want it taken out. Tommy wants money. If he can get them to keep it in and pay him a license fee to use it or just buy the sound off him outright, he could make a lot of money. Yeah, I'd rather them just uh, pay me and them own the sound forever so that it stays in the game. Tommy cannot stress enough how much he doesn't want Roblox to remove the sound because that's how he makes money from this. Uh, I never asked Roblox to remove the sound. I don't want it to be removed. I haven't told them to take the sound out of the game. I want to keep the sound in the game, so. And Roblox probably wants to keep the immensely popular sound in their game. However, they are a business. Their ultimate goal is to keep as much of their money as possible. A majority of Roblox's income comes from underpaying the people who actually make the game's content. How much do you think they're willing to pay for 0.3 seconds of a child saying ow, especially when they could replace it for free? Uh, Roblox could remove the sound tomorrow if they wanted to. So when Tommy approached them asking for money, Roblox offered him less. We approached Roblox, we said, hey, there's a situation and we're gonna ask for this much. Roblox said, eh, we think you should get this much. <laughs> so, so, you know, this much is what we think. Just to put it in plain English, the purpose of this stream is for Tommy to complain that Roblox will not offer him enough money to buy a sound effect they don't need. I think they're, they're nuts and disrespectful to me, this is an all-time classic Talarico moment right here. Complaining about respect while calling someone nuts and asking them for more money. It's just incredible. I'm hoping that we can come together, I don't know, maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, to make everyone happy. One question really starts to stand out in this 90-minute stream. How much money does he want? He's very careful to never say how much he thinks the sound effect is worth, how much he asked for, or how much they offered him. And, and I, can, I can't tell you, people are gonna say, well, how much did you ask for? Huh? Look, you have to understand that, is, that it is not professional of me to go around stating how much money I'm asking and how much they are offering. Just to be clear, unless there's some kind of non-disclosure agreement, which he probably would have said if there was, there isn't anything actually stopping Tommy from saying how much he wants for the sound effect. The Amico saga has proven irrefutably that Tommy does not care in the slightest about appearing professional. That excuse doesn't work. He's choosing not to say it and getting increasingly defensive as viewers keep asking and he runs out of explanations. To be honest, None of your damn business. No, no. I did. How much did you say for them to pay for the oof sound? Okay, well, I've, I've already, I've already gone over that. That I, I can't talk about that. To an outside observer and the chat whose questions he was dodging, it started to feel like Tommy just wanted a embarrassingly large amount of money for a single sound effect, and knew that it would make him look really greedy if he said it. People are never gonna know, you know, what it is, and and it, there doesn't need to be. Uh, that knowledge. He's in the fascinatingly awkward position of not being able to say how much he wants, even though that's what the stream is about. It would be unprofessional to talk about that, um, but I think I did describe that it's um, 
a lot more than what you know they were offering which was barely anything at all i think it's worth asking how much barely anything is to a millionaire with a dedicated spider-man room and an indoor waterfall in his mansion everyone should have a seven foot waterfall i think installed in your room but the thing that's kind of bad about it is that at night i always have to go to the bathroom wait a minute didn't he already make that joke later in the stream he started taking questions and someone asked him to give the ratio how different the counter offer was tommy percentage wise how far is roblox offer compared to what you ask for. At least a hundred times less. So that, you know, if they offered me $1, I'm asking for a hundred dollars. So, you know, <laughs> if they offered me a thousand dollars, that means I'm asking for a hundred thousand dollars, right? So, so that's how far it is. Off. I find it very curious that he will say how much he asked for, but only in the form of a riddle. Even more curiously, he uses very small amounts of money as examples. He chooses not to say, for example, if they offered me 50 grand, that means I asked for five million dollars. Or if they offered me a hundred grand, okay, I can see why he didn't. And I hope they come to their senses. And, and I know they're, they're probably watching. I don't know, maybe they're not. It's Saturday morning. So that was the situation in January 2020. Roblox were offering to buy the sound. Tommy wanted 100 times more money than they were offering. And if things didn't go his way, he was threatening to take things to court. You know, I have attorneys uh, th that I have, a, I have teams of attorneys. I easily have about 20 different lawyers. We, it's just a difference of opinion on whether or not I help to bring millions of people to their game uh, or not, and what that is worth. That last thing is, I think, why Tommy thinks he can ask for whatever massive amount of money he won't say. In his mind, this one sound effect single-handedly launched the Roblox franchise. But the idea is, is, is that this is a sound that helped to create the franchise, right? Some may say, even, that the reason Roblox is as popular as it is now, may be because of the fact that so many people share this oof sound. So some may say, Tommy, you don't need to launder your arguments like that. You are the one saying that right now. This is something that helped to create the franchise itself. It's made the game Roblox go supersonic. It was part of the reason. How many millions of people found out about the game Roblox because of a meme that had that used because of the sound, right? We think we're asking for something extremely fair considering what it has done for the franchise. These claims are hilarious, exaggerated, but most of all, wrong. Take the sound effects from Minecraft that are really popular and people use a lot in videos too. <clears throat> they have a huge presence online as well, but they didn't make Minecraft popular. They're popular because they're in a game millions of children have played. The Roblox oof took off in mid-2017, when Roblox was already a pretty mainstream thing. The cause and effect is completely backwards here. While it might not be entirely impossible for a single sound effect to make a game very popular, I would like to remind everyone that this sound effect was already in a game, and that game was such a massive critical and commercial failure that no one noticed the sound effect had been stolen for 20 fucking years. Come on, bud. Roblox didn't become a multi-billion dollar company because of a sound effect. They got there by being evil. Speaking of evil, Roblox eventually worked with Tommy to turn all of this into a whole new way of monetizing their empire of nightmares. Instead of paying Tommy for the sound, they're making the players pay for it. In November 2020, Roblox announced the oof sound was going to be removed, but they were updating their developer marketplace so players could purchase sounds to use in their games. And once this update was complete, the oof sound could be purchased and used through there. I assume Tommy would get a cut from this. Simultaneously, Tommy announced he had produced a sound effects pack for creators to use in their Roblox games, including the oof. I have done a brand new sound design library just for Roblox. Creators could buy a range of sound effects packs costing from $10 to $250 and use these in the games they make. Roblox and Tommy agreed to keep the sound in the game as is for a while so the sound marketplace had time to get up and running and no one had to go oofless in the meantime. But this functionality still hasn't been added a year and a half later. Eventually, in July this year, Roblox, citing a licensing issue, removed the sound and replaced it with this one. <coughs> which is rubbish, frankly. 
but it might be bad on purpose to incentivize paying to replace it once they get the marketplace up. So, clever move, I guess. You bags of scum. Tommy also got to make some official OOF merch, so that was nice for him, I suppose. I've created an OOF t-shirt. It doesn't look like he got the massive payday he wanted, especially since the audio marketplace hasn't manifested yet, but at least he got something out of it. So, there we go. Wasn't that an interesting story? That's the end of the video essay. Don't look at the runtime. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. J if you came here to find the origins of a sound effect, you can go. Subscribe on the way out if you'd like, but take care. Go play Roblox or something. And uh, Tommy, I know you're watching. I've seen you arguing with people in the comments of videos with 100 views. You can go as well. Go do whatever it is you do in your fun house. I'm just chilling out. See ya. Okay, I think they're gone. This video is being filmed in an undisclosed location to avoid being traced. Also, mum went on holiday and she locked the garage so I can't get to my set. And no, I have no idea why the back wall of this room is also green. The last guy who lived here had terrible taste. Anyway, I think he's gone. Okay. We need to talk about Tommy. This is where the video was supposed to finish. So I was writing up the script and doing a bit more research, and then I re-watched Tommy's E3 2021 pitch for the Amico, and I realized something. He takes credit for creating the oof in a very particular way. I'm even the guy who did the oof sound for Roblox. He made the sound for Roblox? I thought I misheard him or maybe he misspoke, but no, that's how he says it. The thing that you might know me the most from is the guy who created the beloved oof sound for Roblox, that's right. The sound wasn't made for Roblox, it was made for another game and reused by mistake. That's what this whole thing was about, Tommy. He said that one in the commercial for his sound design kits he's selling to put it back in the game. Why is he saying it like that? Well, obviously the idea he made it for Roblox, this massive important corporation, is slightly more prestigious than the truth, isn't it? So he's slightly altering the story to give himself a bit more credit. And that's fine, like whatever, who cares? But then I thought, you know, for a sound with another guy's name on it, he seems pretty happy to say he personally made it for Roblox. From an outsider's perspective, it looks a bit like Tommy is taking credit for something someone who worked for him did decades later. And yeah, sure, my script was almost done, but I couldn't let that possibility sit unexplored. So I tried to figure out who actually made the sound. And what I discovered was interesting. And then a bunch more other shit happened and now the video is this long. I'm so sorry. Yes, Joey's name is on the file, but that doesn't necessarily mean he created it. If he did the final exporting of the sounds Tallarico Studios made for Messiah, his audio program would put his name on them regardless of who recorded, edited, or mastered them. Instead, let's look at how Tommy talks about who made it. Let's rewind the clock a little. Back in 2019, Tommy quote tweeted that one video that was a repost of the thing Plasmanode put on Reddit. He indicates that his company created and owns the sounds used for Messiah, and that the sound effects was created by my lead sound designer Joey Kouros. Notice that he specifically doesn't say that he made it. He says his company created and owns it, and then specifically credits Joey, implying little to no direct personal involvement. I believe this version of Tommy's story is true. However, soon after writing this, to put it bluntly, it looks like Tommy realized how popular the sound was. He's said in many places, including the live stream, that he didn't really know that much about Roblox until he found out one of his sounds was in it. So on a timeline, it looks like he wrote that tweet and then started looking at the sound's presence online. In his next tweet, he says he's surprised to discover the sound has tens of millions of views online, and then all of a sudden it's a sound we created. And then, and he adds this in parenthesis, like he's trying to sneak it into the story at the last minute, and I myself recorded. This is a bit of a change, isn't it? It's also just a weird way of talking about something you created. Like, if you found out something you had made, you, was in a huge game, you would go, hey, I made that. 
You wouldn't go, as you can see, my company created and owns that. It was made by someone who worked for me decades ago. Oh wait, the sound's really popular. I mean, we made it and I myself recorded it. And to his credit, I think Tommy noticed how this sounds too, because 30 minutes later, he tried again. He started a second thread where this time it's a sound he created, Joey edited, and he owns. Note that he specifically used the word created again. So he got his story straight in the end at least. Good for him. But that does mean this first tweet is a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Now, you tell me, what one thing would make Tommy look more like he was trying to rewrite the history after the fact here? Deleting the tweet, right? From my perspective, that would be a very stupid thing to do. But I must be missing something because he did delete it. It's gone. I am not accusing famous industry veteran Tommy Tellerico of lying about who made a sound here. I don't know for sure who did what on this sound. But Tommy should. And if he's telling the truth, why did the truth change when he was surprised by how popular the sound was? In a very short span of time, Tommy's version of history went from Joey created it, to we created it, to I created it, and then later an attempt to delete the fact he said Joey created it. I know how it sounds, it would be weird to assume someone just wants to brag about making this one sound effect this badly. But he does brag about it. He put it in his Twitter handle, it's part of his pitch for the Amico. It seems very important to Tommy that he doesn't just own the sound, that he personally created it. To most people younger than me, that sound effect could be the most well-known thing on his resume, which is a bit depressing really. And when he tries to describe the process of creating the sound, Things get even weirder. In the OOF livestream, Tommy's happy to say he made the sound, but then he tries to go into detail about how it was made. I thought what first I would do is talk about how the OOF sound was created. When he talks about the work that went into making the sound, he doesn't say he did anything. He says we. Then what we did is we went through you know all the different lines we did a whole bunch of other stuff to it as well so after we pitch shifted it down and then sometimes he accidentally says i and then corrects himself i wanted to let folks know uh, how i created the sound how we created the sound myself and uh, my sound designer uh, joey curris it just keeps going like this we start to tweak the sound each individual sound so again and in, in oof we might have spent you know a half hour trying to figure out exactly which way we should have pitched it down and what thing we would have taken and this and that. This is a strange way to describe something you did. Far from being a sound he created and Joey merely edited, whenever he has to describe any specifics, all of a sudden it was done by committee. Tommy isn't lying about who did what here, quite the opposite really. He's specifically avoiding lying by being as vague as possible about something it would be easy to talk about if he actually made the sound himself. So I, I, I took this little girl's, uh, we took the clip, right? And um, and then what we did is we edited it and we, we, we kept the length of the sound. He struggles to come up with anything he actually did. Like his knowledge helped. And um, we'll say, uh, um, I wanna say this right. I mean, it, it took a lot of uh, my knowledge of audio to create this sound and make it sound uh, unique. Now that people know about me, they know about how I created the Roblox sound. After seeing a guy specifically avoid saying I and say we dozens of times and then finish the story by saying, so that's how I made the sound? It just comes off really disingenuous. One quick indicator of what he could mean by we is, at one point he uses it to describe the act of exporting the sound out of the program. You know, compressing it and making it all, EQing it and doing all these crazy things to it uh, before we ended up saving it out, so. When he says we here, he just means Joey. It only takes one person to hit save on a file, and that's the one thing we know for sure Joey did. Like with the money situation, it's hard not to read into why Tommy is talking strangely. It starts to sound like Joey did most of the work, 
but then that would mean someone else deserves the credit for creating the sound. So all of a sudden, this 0.3 second sound effect becomes a team effort. That's Tommy's version of how the sound was made. He says we, but sometimes when he says we, he just means Joey. So what's Joey's version? Joey's been pretty quiet about all this, and good for him. His career's still going strong, unlike some people's, and I'm sure he has better things to do than litigate who made an ancient sound effect. Unlike me, who apparently has plenty of time for that shit. However, Kurus does have a website where he maintains credits for every game he's worked on since 1993, and he's still updating it today. Next to Messiah, Joey puts, design of all sound effects. After witnessing someone claim Joey did it, change their mind, delete the story, and then talk in very vague terms about who did what. Um. Seeing someone just say, I designed all the sound effects is like a breath of fresh air. This is another reason why I find Tommy's first version of the story more believable. Not only is it untainted by his later discovery how popular the sound was, it's also what the other person who worked on the game said. But this really makes it look like Tommy's stealing credit from someone else who worked for him now. It was just a hunch before, but now... I don't know. And here's when the fun, easy video about the Roblox oof I was trying to make ended, and the horror of my new life began. Because while I was on Joey's page, I noticed something else. Design of all sound effects for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. This was very confusing to read, because Tommy spent the last several decades saying he worked on Pro Skater. Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Uh, I was on the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Uh, team. I was on the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater team. I'm not saying Tommy didn't work on it, it's just some places seem to disagree with him. Places like the credits of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. According to them, someone else did the in-game sound effects. I'll give you three guesses. It was, it was Joey, it was Joey. Although the company he was at is credited as well. It's like they're saying sound effects done by this guy from this company. But Tommy's acting like he personally did it again. I'm starting to feel a bit bad for Joey. Just to kind of add to the mystery, he talks about how small the development team was at the time. To kind of add to the exclusivity of it, I guess. You know, being a part of the original uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater mm. team, you know, there's only about maybe 10 or 12 of us. This means very few people exist who could possibly contradict him. How convenient. <laughs> it does make it even weirder though for such a small team to leave his name out of the credits. I guess Tommy could say his name is in there, but only because his company is named Tommy Tallarico Studios. So who is responsible for the sounds in Pro Skater? The guy credited for it, or his boss who says he did it now? In an older interview slash house tour, Tommy got a bit more specific. He said he'd buy skateboards, oh sorry, I mean we'd buy skateboards. We buy skateboards. And then Tommy would help this mysterious other person record the sounds. He says one of the pain sound effects, ironically also a kind of oof, is his actual voice. The actual sound in Tony Hawk that you hear when the guy falls off the skateboard and cracks his head open, that's me falling off, cracking my head. So, Tommy might have helped with some of the sounds. Or at least at some point, Joey recorded him falling off a skateboard. Strangely though, while he says he was on the Pro Skater team nowadays, at the time, things were very different. You see, as I mentioned earlier, Tommy was on a TV show about games while Pro Skater was being made. The thing about journalism is, it's usually frowned upon to cover or review a product you helped create without disclosing you worked on it. And, to his credit, Tommy's very good at this. When he and co-host Victor cover games he was involved with, they make sure to say it. Take Advent Rising, a game he composed a ton of music for. Advent Rising. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment on any of the music in the game, because I am completely biased. This is, and I mean this unironically, ethical gaming journalism. Also, you might have noticed, but Tommy kind of likes to brag about games he's worked on. One time they reviewed an Aladdin game, and they brought up that Tommy worked on a different Aladdin game's music eight years before? It was a great throwback to the 16-bit platformer days, and I know you worked on the original Aladdin game, so you must have felt like you were coming Deja home a vu. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy not only understands disclosure, he loves doing it. If Tommy worked on a game, or a game similar to the one being reviewed, you hear about it on this show. So, what does it mean when Tommy doesn't say he worked on a game? While Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was being made, it was featured on the show. Tommy interviewed one of the developers. Later, when it came out, Tommy and Victor reviewed it, and both gave it a 9.5 out of 10. If Tommy worked on this game's sound effects, he would have said so wouldn't he? 
Well, he doesn't. At no point whatsoever in the coverage does Tommy disclose he worked on the game. Tommy behaves like a TV guy interviewing a game developer. Which would be a bit weird if he was also on that development team, right? I can only think of a few reasons why Tommy wouldn't mention he worked on the game when he goes out of his way to do so normally. One is he randomly decided not to take credit for something, which seems out of character and pretty dishonest considering how hard he promoted the game, and he seems to know better than that. The alternative is, while he had helped Joey out a little, Tommy, at the time, didn't consider whatever input he gave big enough to justify telling people he was involved. Which is fascinating to me. There is potentially a past version of Tommy who, if he honestly thought about it, would choose not to say he worked on Pro Skater which is cool of him. However, then Pro Skater went on to be a really famous franchise and it became very cool to say you worked on it. I was on the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater team. And over the years, Tommy's story has grown a bit from helping with some of the sounds to uh, doing all of them. I was on the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater team. So I did all those uh, sounds, audio director on that. Uh, Wait, now he's saying he was the audio director? He's, he's not even in the credit! Let's quickly look at who did what on games Tellerico Studios worked on. On the vast majority, Tommy is often credited for music, but he doesn't do sound effects much. Sound effects, or sound design as it was later called, is usually done by Joey. A game Tellerico Studios worked on almost always has music by Tommy, sound effects by Joey in the credits. Basically, when Tommy and Joey work on games together, it's pretty clear who did what. In fact, in the early 2000s, Tellerico Studios put out a sound effects library you could buy and use in your own projects, with over 19,500 sound effects in it. Tommy's the executive producer, so I'm sure he was involved, in some capacity, but three other recorders and editors are credited, along with the sound designer. I wonder who it could be! It's Joey. It's always Joey. Joey credits himself as the lead sound designer at Tellerico Studios for 13 years. The thing he did was sound effects. Even on Electric Playground, Tommy's show, Joey is credited for additional sound effects. So maybe Tommy didn't say he did the sound effect on Pro Skater because he knew Joey would see it. Given Tommy's tendency to take games his sound effects guy is credited for and say he did all the sounds, what does that sort of thing mean for his later claims about Messiah and making the oof? Well, wouldn't it be funny if Tommy also reviewed Messiah on TV and when he did he again did not mention he worked on the game? Wouldn't that be very, very funny? Yeah, it is funny. That is what happened. Even funnier, on that same episode, they also reviewed the Dreamcast version of Pro Skater, giving Tommy yet another opportunity to say he worked on it. Which he didn't. There's starting to be a precedent for Joey doing things, being the one credited for it, Tommy reviewing it and not mentioning he worked on it, and then years later deciding he did. Coming back to how he talks on the stream, we could mean we both worked on this sound, but to be cynical, it can also mean Joey did it while working for me. Messiah is one of the two or so games I could find that Tellerico Studios made where they are both credited for the sound effects at once, so potentially Tommy might have been more involved with the sound effects on this than normal. So our candidates are a guy who mostly did music and not sound effects, reviewed the game on television and chose not to say he worked on it, and when he later decided he did and he made this sound, carefully avoided taking credit for anything specific, um. or the guy credited for sound effects on almost every other game, who says he did it, who Tommy said did it before he changed his mind the first time, and whose name is on the file. In conclusion, who knows? Could have been either of them. Maybe it was both. Art is really a collaborative process. Okay, that was written as a joke about how heavily the deck is stacked here, but let's be serious, I haven't found any definitive proof here. I think it's interesting just how much Joey is credited for sound effects everywhere else, and I think it's weird that Tommy didn't really have any specifics to say about what he did on the sound, and I think if he did work on the game that closely he should have said so when he reviewed the game on television, but none of that is specific proof of who recorded or mastered a specific sound effect. However, given all of this additional context and information, I can say at least for myself that I have some trouble believing Tommy when he says he made the sound. But when you decide something a well-known industry figure like him has said is suspect, you start to ask, well, 
what else has he said? This guy's been around for decades and he's said a lot of things. I started investigating some of his other claims. I did it mostly to prove to myself I was just being silly so I could believe him when he said that he made the sound. I wanted to be able to put this to bed and move on with my life. I just couldn't accept that the first American to ever work on Sonic would lie like that. Hey, wait a second. Yes, Tommy has repeatedly said he's the first American to ever work on Sonic. In fact, I was the very first American to ever be hired by the Sonic team oh, back in the day. Are you serious? The very first, yeah, very first American to be to, to be hired. One of the first Americans to ever uh, be hired uh, by Sega of Japan uh, for the Sonic team. I was the first American to ever be hired to work on the Sonic uh, the Hedgehog series. But if you don't take Tommy's word for it and do your own research, by which I mean basically Google Sonic for two seconds, you start to see red flags. Sonic was being developed in America as early as 1992 when Sonic 2 was being made in California. Americans are all over Sonic's game development since almost the beginning. Which game did Tommy work on anyway? Sonic, uh... Some of the, uh, or one of the Sonic games, Black Knight, I might have been in the 2000s. So Tommy was about 20 years late to the party of Americans working on Sonic. Okay, let's be charitable. Maybe he means first American to do music for the series? But if he thinks that, Tommy's been crushing too many 40s. That was terrible. I promise to live and learn from the, oh fuck. But this first American stuff gets even deeper. There are layers to this shit. One particular American musician, Michael Jackson, was rumored for decades to have worked on Sonic 3. This was seemingly confirmed by Yuji Naka earlier this year, actually. This would make Jackson the first American to do a Sonic soundtrack. Maybe there are some Americans who worked on one earlier? I'm not sure. I'm not deep into Sonic lore. I'm no Heriton Splimby. Now you could say, well, sure. Maybe that means Tommy is wrong about being the first American. But there's no way he could have known that. We only found out for sure recently. And yeah, to be fair, that would be true. Were it not for the fact Tommy has also been bragging about knowing back in the 90s that Jackson worked on Sonic. So I was really close with the, uh, the Sega folks back in the early 90s. I don't know if it was ever confirmed or not, but, uh, but I can tell you that he did do the music for Sonic 3. This was at a con in 2014, before he started saying he was the first American. So either he knew he was lying when he started saying that, or he made this shit up too. Which one is the lie? At this point, why not both? I don't trust this story about knowing about Jackson either, frankly. I think he just made up a story to seem involved with another important piece of history. That seems to be his MO at this point. This is just one example of what we could charitably call exaggeration, but realistically we call lies. The more I tried to check things Tommy said to prove to myself that any of it was true, the more it all came apart. Okay, so what about the Metroid Prime thing? He said in a bunch of places, including the Oof stream, that he worked on Metroid Prime. Uh, Metroid Prime with Shigeru Miyamoto. Uh, worked on that for uh, for a couple of years. And I worked with him on Metroid uh, Prime, hmm? the first one. And we worked together for about, gosh, I want to say four or five years. Metroid Prime, I worked with that with uh, Shigeru Miyamoto for five years. Wow. I worked with Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of Mario and Zelda, worked with him for five years on uh, Metroid Prime. He doesn't just say he worked on it, actually. He says Shigeru Miyamoto was a personal huge fan of his work and always wanted to work on a game with him. We always talked about working together. We're like, oh man, I really love all your Mario stuff. And he'd say, oh man, I love all your your stuff that you do, like, oh, we gotta work together sometime, you know? I don't know if that part of the story is true, but Talarico Studios was contracted to work on Prime. Not music, by the way, Prime already had a composer, they just did sound effects. That might turn out to be important later. But early in development, Retro cancelled all their other projects to focus on Prime, and suddenly didn't need outside help to get the audio done, and his contract wasn't renewed. Tommy will confirm this part of the story himself. My contract was coming to an end was around the same time that, that Retro those projects were all getting canceled except for Metroid, and they had an internal audio department. So he did work on it, 
briefly, but again with the exaggeration. For him to be dropped so easily implies Miyamoto wasn't as invested in working with Tommy as he says. Tommy doesn't just say he worked on Prime sound effects for a bit and Miyamoto was a huge fan though, his story gets way more exotic. He tells people Miyamoto didn't give him any direction or visuals or animations to make sound effects to. He told him to just make what he thought was cool and the development team designed the weapons and animations around his sounds. Give us a bunch of epic weapon sounds and then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give those to my artists and then they are gonna be inspired by the sounds that you make and we're gonna inspire the art and the thing. Wow, so cool. This is an unprecedented amount of control for an external audio contractor to have over a project. Plus it just doesn't mix very well with the fact he left really early in development. Did Miyamoto change his mind? Why didn't he make Retro keep him on board if he had such an important job? It also doesn't mix with other stories from Retro Studio's actual audio department. He did an interview for Shinespark as where he told this story about Miyamoto letting him design the weapon sounds first. However, Shinespark has then went on to interview Clark Wen, Prime's audio lead, who came on board after the other games were cancelled and Tommy was gone. Wen is well respected in the game audio industry, he's worked on a bunch of stuff, including Tony Hawk games, interestingly enough. According to him, they did sound effects the normal way, basing their work off the art and animations. There's something amazing about reading an interview with Tommy where Miyamoto blessed the project with a radical new technique where the sound designer had massive creative control over the game, and then going to the interview with Wen where they say, we interviewed Tommy and he said you did this, and he goes, that sounds cool, but no. Wen says one or two weapon sound effects were done when he got there and he left them mostly untouched. So a few of the sounds in the game are done by Tallarico Studios and they might have been done the way Tommy said, but his overall involvement with the game was very small. How small? He left so early in development they forgot he had worked on it by the time the game was done and forgot to put his name in the credits. A bunch of other audio contractors made it in though. They must have kept contracting people after he left and not got him back. Weird, I wonder why. After seeing Tommy repeatedly take credit for the work of people under him, it's kind of cathartic seeing a bunch of other people get credited and for him to be forgotten. However, he's not the only one. Someone's missing from Tommy's version of the story again! Can you guess? In a now deleted page on his website, accessible via the Internet Archive, Tommy wrote about leaving early in development, although he still claims he did a lot of the main sound design somehow. Funnily enough, he doesn't say I too much. He says we. I wonder who the other per- It's Joey! It's always Joey! He shared a recent email from Retro's new audio manager to prove he worked on it, and he compliments the work Tellerico Studios did, but he says it like this. My hat is off to you, Tommy. And Joey? It's always Joey! What makes this story even funnier is how, you know, Tommy was on a TV show that reviewed games when Prime came out. Tommy didn't mention he worked on it, which makes sense, he was barely involved. But one fascinating thing that hasn't come up yet is Tommy just has terrible taste. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? The characters are incredibly stupid. He complained about Prime's backtracking and scanning system, stuff people love about the game, and absolutely refused to let Victor get a word in edgewise. I had to scan every little There's thing. There's a great story role. in there as well. I and think that's a problem for me. But I enjoyed worst, all of that. The worst problem about this game yes. is that he gave it a 7.5, which according to Metacritic would be the absolute lowest score any remotely professional critic gave it at the time. Even less than the 8 the guy who wrote the text reviews for EP gave it. Tommy was not the biggest fan of this game, but now it's universally recognized as a masterpiece, he can't wait to tell you he was a huge part of it. It's kind of fascinating how these two supposed industry professionals each talk about their work. Joey doesn't mention Prime at all on his site. Presumably, he doesn't consider his work a large enough part of the finished game to go on a resume. Meanwhile, Tommy talks like he worked hand in hand with Shigeru Miyamoto for five years on Metroid Prime. Oh, come on, H1, be reasonable. He doesn't say it like that. No, he says it like that. I worked hand in hand with Shigeru Miyamoto for five years on Metroid Prime. But he said on his own website he left early. He left so early they forgot to put him in the credits. He he knows he's not telling the truth when he says this. Okay, look, 
Maybe I'm just a gaming racist, but is it okay at this point to call this an obvious lie? It must be very difficult to work hand in hand with someone on a game they famously did not work on very much. Retro Studios is based in Texas. Miyamoto was a distant producer who occasionally gave notes. Several former Retro employees have even suggested he gave Metroid to a new company in America that hadn't made any games yet because he didn't like Metroid that much. Some insinuating he didn't really get Metroid's type of gameplay. Miyamoto pawned off IPs like this repeatedly, actually. He visited Rare one day and made them turn a game they were making into a Star Fox game because he had no idea what else to do with Star Fox. And we all know how that turned out. It's actually pretty good, people are just mean. Prime is great, but it happened because Miyamoto outsourced an IP he didn't like to a bunch of Americans so he didn't have to think about it. Which gives very different implications to Miyamoto asking Tommy to do the sound effects. So now almost every game he's bragged about working on has turned out to be a gross exaggeration. The only other games he talks about are Earthworm Jim and Aladdin. I guess there's one more, a uh, Guitar Hero. Guitar Hero. Guitar Hero uh, franchise uh, did some work on uh, some of the uh, the first three Guitar Hero games. You know, like some of the games I've worked on, Disney's Aladdin, Earthworm Jim, Guitar Hero. Uh, any of his songs on the soundtrack? Uh, no. Did he do sound effects? It doesn't look like it. Is he credited on any of the games? On one of them, yeah. According to a Joystick interview, rest in peace, comrade, he helped them get an Aerosmith song on too because his cousin is Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. He's in the credits of Guitar Hero 2 in the Industry Thanks section. His involvement seems I don't know, kind of small. It's mostly people who championed the first Guitar Hero when it came out. You know, game journalists and celebrities. And Will Wheaton. Interestingly, alongside Brad Shoemaker, Ryan Davis, and of course Jeff Gershman, also in these credits is Patrick Klepek, who 15 years later would go on to make him delete a legal threat by asking him a basic question. This is the total extent I can find of Tommy's involvement with the Guitar Hero games. But I must be missing something. The way he brings it up, you'd think he was massively involved. I've worked on the Guitar Hero games, the the first three. Um, the third one was Guitar Hero Aerosmith. Um, now you know why. I want to assume Tommy was joking there, but at this point, I don't know. The more you look at Tommy's weird exaggerations, overstatements of credit, his use of we to mean Joey, the more you see it. It starts to take over your mind. You start to ask yourself if even the stuff he couldn't possibly be lying about is a lie. Like, okay, are those Guinness World Records real? I assumed even if everything else was fake, they would be real at least. There's no way anyone could get away with such an obvious lie, it would be too easy to check. But it turns out if something is easy to check, no one actually does. Let's start with the big one. The person who has worked on the most video games in their lifetime. That's what he calls it, at least. I, that's, I hold the Guinness World Record for the person who's worked on the most video games in their life. My, my mother's very proud. The person who's worked on the most video games in their lifetime. My mother's very proud for the person who's worked on the most video games in a lifetime. So that, that was pretty cool. My mother's very proud for the person who's worked on the most video games in their lifetime, which is kind of kind of crazy, kind of a cool Honor, my mother's very proud. The person who's worked on the most video games in their life. Yeah, my, uh, my mother is very proud. There's several problems with this one. Let's start with how the number of games he's worked on keeps expanding, and not in the sexy way. By the time of his first Guinness World Record in 2008, he'd worked on the production of 272 games. Around this time, he stopped doing music for games and started focusing on video games live. Video games live takes up such a huge part of your, yeah. your time and your career, so yeah. have you ever considered going back to like full-time video game composing? No. <laughs> there was this period in the early 2010s where the last game he'd officially worked on outside of Super Tofu Boy was Sonic and the Black Knight. The last game I composed for was actually a Sonic game, and that was a couple years ago, but yeah. But somehow, two years later, he had a record with over 300 games on it. In October 2017, he said he'd worked on over 300 games. In fact, I have a Guinness World Record for the person who's worked on the most video games in their lifetime, over 300 games. But by the time of the OOF stream in January 2020, just over two years later, it was over 350. And uh, I've worked on over 350 uh, 
of video games. He had a busy couple of years there. I read today uh, 300 video games you've had your hands in. That, that can't be a real number. Yeah, no, it's actually 350. Yeah, it's up wow. to 350 now. That I know a lot of people in the industry. I've worked on 200, uh, 350 games in my career. Okay, Tommy seems a little confused himself how many he's done. So, you know, just for his sake, we should probably double check how many. So, uh... Is there a list somewhere? His Wikipedia page lists far less games than he says he's worked on. Fewer, God damn it! I used Wikipedia for that visual earlier, showing the games he'd worked on in the early 2010s. Let's show everything else he did afterwards. Nothing. He cameoed in Retro City Rampage, and that's it, according to Wikipedia. His IMDb splits his credits into a dozen different categories, but not games, television, and movies, because it's a horrible website. And the composer and sound department credits have a bunch of games repeated in both? Wow, he's credited for some of them three times. Even Messiah's in there twice. Earthworm Jim 2's in there four times? But even adding literally all the video game credits together, including all the duplicates, you get less than half the number he said he'd done 15 years ago! What the fuck is happening?! His Moby Games page lists about 100? Uh, it's 6.13am right now and my eyes went a bit blurry while I was counting. It could be like 98? Either way, it's a lot less than 350 and I'm not recounting this shit. And that's counting a bunch he's just in the thanks for, like Guitar Hero 2. It doesn't list Pro Skater because he's not in the credits for that, even though Moby Games appear to have copy-pasted the official biography from his website, which claims he did. They somehow managed to get Pro Skater to link to the correct game page, but not to get the spelling right. Okay, none of these websites can be trusted. Thankfully, Tommy has taken it upon himself to make his own list of games on his website. This list is larger, and I mean a lot larger than the others, and since Tommy wrote it, there's some dubious names on here. Pro Skater and Guitar Hero are on there, and so is Metroid Prime. Obviously, he personally held hands with the development team while they made it, but so is Prime 2, a game I've never seen any mention of him touching anyone's hands on. Did they reuse some sounds him slash Joey made, so that counts as working on both? And I guess I can now add Roblox to that list of games. If Tommy thinks he can put Roblox on the list of games he has worked on, Imagine what justifications other games are on this list for. One of Tommy's actually interesting contributions to game history is early PlayStation 1 models came with a demo disc to show what the console could do, and some of his music is in the menus and titles. The first sounds ever made by some early PlayStations would be music made by Tommy. This is kind of neat and cool, and it's also weird seeing PlayStation Demo Disc in a list of games composed for. In general, this list has quite a bit of what we call padding. Tellerico Studios did additional music for the first Blood Rain, so that's one game worked on, right? Well, it's on Tommy's list five times as each console version along with PC and Mac. I'm not sure why you'd want to give Blood Rain such a strong presence on your resume, but each to their own. He also did the music for Earthworm Jim 1 and 2. An Earthworm Jim game is on his list. 18 times! Super Tofu Boy, a free Flash game Peter made he donated music to, is on here twice! You can run Flash games on the Mac too? Wow, that's an extra game worked on! Fuck you, Tommy! But even counting all of this, all the games he wasn't credited for but still puts on his list, the multiple times the same game is counted across many different consoles or computers, or demo discs, as specific games worked on, it's still a lot less than the number he says. If you decide to be a bit mean and remove all the repeat games, you get around 175, almost a hundred less than his first Guinness World Record said 15 years ago. So either he stopped updating his website, and IMDB, Moby Games, Wikipedia, and everywhere else also stopped tracking the games he worked on, or, Bob forgive me, the first American to ever work on Sonic is exaggerating again. In an interview in 2010, he said he worked on 280 video games, which is a Guinness World Record. Actually inside the Guinness Book as the person who worked on the most video games in their life. This sentence almost made me cut my fucking head off. Tommy isn't actually inside the Guinness Book of World Records he's talking about here. Trust me, I checked. He is, however, inside that year's Guinness Book of World Records... Gamers Edition. The Gamers Edition is full of more game-centric records. Notice that it's also much smaller and the print quality is much worse, and generally it's a lot less prestigious than being in the actual book. My producer, Kat, left a comment on that line in the script saying, it's a bit like saying you gave a TED talk when really you just gave a TEDx talk. Not realizing how fucking funny 
funny she was being because Tommy has done a TEDx talk. My mother's very proud. When his biography on his website calls it a TED talk. He is exactly that guy. She is so cool. I love her. Tommy is at least featured in the Gamers Edition. It's a two-page interview about his career and video games live. At the beginning of the interview, the author claims Tommy has worked on more game soundtracks than anyone else. They don't say how they verified this or provide the list of games. It seems a bit like Tommy just told the interviewer this in the interview and they repeated it as a factoid, assuming it was true, because why would someone tell such an obvious lie? Whatever evidence he has backing up his claim is becoming difficult to find. Luckily, this wasn't too expensive on eBay. Uh, supplies are quite low, but the demand... It's just me, basically. I mentioned how surprisingly cheap these were to Mandalore Gaming, and he started bulk buying them to leave in Airbnbs he stays in, like a sort of gamer Dian Bible. So if they seem more expensive now, it's because he's artificially inflated the price. Speaking of artificial inflation, even if the amount of games Tommy says he's worked on was completely true, there are still people who've worked on way more games. The record is just wrong. Even Guinness at some point recognized this. They actually changed the wording of the record at some point after he first got it. It's not person who has worked on the most games in a lifetime anymore, it's most prolific composer of game soundtracks. The Guinness website says that now, and the updated versions of Tommy's plaque say that too. So Guinness have done their best to correct this mistake. Tommy, however, has continued using the original name anyway for over a decade. In fact, I own the Guinness World Record for the person who's worked on the most video games in their lifetime. My mother's very proud. Another one of those sweet little lies we've become accustomed to Tommy using. Although I can kind of understand this one, because the new name is even more obviously a lie. I know for a fact Tommy has not made 280 video game soundtracks. We need to acknowledge just how bonkers this clip is. He's saying most video games in a lifetime while showing footage of the new record with a different name. Bonus points for the fact the record says more than 300 games, but then it cuts to a list he wrote with less than 300 games on it. And just in case it needs to be said, no, Guinness are not a real record-keeping organization. They're a novelty book company. It's already a pretty common joke that most of their records are just silly stuff someone made up so they can have a record. Like, most baseball bats broken in one minute. That's a silly one I just made up now. Just kidding, it's real. I don't really mind if Guinness track a bunch of silly records. It's just a bit of fun, really. But they are an utterly for-profit organization, not just in terms of sales of books, but also sales of records. Guinness has an entire subsection on their website dedicated to business marketing solutions, promising they can help with PR and marketing campaigns, complete with a case studies section showing over a dozen pages of companies they got attention for by helping them come up with a new record to break, like Canon with its longest digitally printed photograph. If you have the money, you can pay them to help you break a record. I have my suspicions a lot of the silly record holders are independently wealthy people. You know, some people just want a record to call their own to give their empty lives a sense of meaning. Guinness aren't purposefully keeping track of who's broken the most bats or wasted the most money on a Pokemon card. Having a Guinness adjudicator on site to verify and give out the award on the day is super expensive, at minimum $10,000 plus transport and hotel costs. This stuff gets expensive fast. They aren't a neutral party tracking human achievements, they are a paid service, and many of their record holders are basically just customers. You'll notice that when it became clear someone else should have the record for most games made in a lifetime, they didn't give someone else the record, they changed it to one Tommy was more likely to have. I'm curious how much they charge for this service. Guinness's record search function claims Tommy is involved with two more. These are for video games live. What great marketing these must have been. They are most video game concerts performed and largest audience for a live video game music concert. Let's quickly appreciate how sneaky these records are. VGL haven't come close to performing the most concerts, but most video game concerts, now that's a record. And it's highly specific, so no one can challenge it. In fact, you literally can't challenge it. The Guinness website says these records are not accepting active submissions. This is a special record only Tommy can get. And wouldn't you believe it? At his 357th concert, one of those prohibitively expensive adjudicators turned up to hand him the latest version of these two records. But let's look closer at largest audience for a live video game music concert for a second. Uh, the biggest symphony show ever seen live over 752,000 people watching us live in Beijing China this would be pretty impressive 
Would you be shocked if I told you Tommy's story is inaccurate? Not all of those 752,000 people were watching in person in Beijing. Some of them were watching it digitally on a live stream on a Chinese video website. Biggest symphony show ever seen live, 752,000 people watching me live on stage. That was in Beijing. It's a bit deceptive to say they were watching you live on stage when they were nowhere near the stage. How many people were actually there? Uh, the, the, the famous... Um, uh, Bird's Nest National Olympic Stadium. We played there, 130,000 people inside, 600,000 people outside. I love that he says outside when he means we're watching a live stream. Like, is he trying to imply hundreds of thousands of people stood outside just to hear his show? But 100k people attending a concert is still a lot. Still a lie, though! You know, I couldn't help but overhear what venue he said this took place at. Bird's Nest National Olympic Stadium. The Bird's Nest is a beautiful stadium, and it must be amazing to play in front of 130,000 people there. In case you're not familiar with the Bird's Nest, allow me to read you the beginning of its Wikipedia page. You're an hour deep into a video about the Roblox oof, you don't have anything better to do. <clears throat> the National Stadium, also known as the Bird's Nest, is an 80,000 capacity stadium in Beijing. <laughs> I think I might have noticed a very small discrepancy. During the 2008 Olympics, it hit its record attendance of 89,000 people. Tommy is claiming he got better attendance than the Olympics and can fold space. But because it's Tommy, there are layers of mistruth happening here. You see, Tommy has the name of the venue wrong. Guinness has an article about this record, and they say it was set at the Beijing Exhibition Theatre, which is a different place. At first I thought this was just a one-off mistake. VGL have played both venues, but the thing is though, he always says it's the bird's nest. Uh, there was the bird's nest in China, Beijing National Olympic Stadium, 750,000 people. Now, maybe he just has the names really mixed up in his head. They are both in Beijing after all, although it is a bit weird to forget where you set your Guinness World Record, but whatever. But is there maybe a reason he says the name of this theater while claiming he played to hundreds of thousands of people? Well, there's one. It would be even more impossible to play to 130,000 people at a theater with only 2,700 seats. The Guinness article also happens to mention the actual number of people physically at the concert. 2,086 people. So even when Guinness has the numbers, he still makes shit up. Tommy, anyone can check this. What are you doing? I don't trust that many people were watching the live stream either. There's no easily obtainable record of the live viewership from the Chinese streaming platform this appeared on. So we, and apparently also Guinness, just have to take Tommy's word for it that almost exactly 700 150,000 people watched this live. And considering we just caught him lying about this exact thing, I have my doubts. Even though he has a record with a specific number written on it, the number keeps changing. In an interview in the 2017 Guinness Book of World Records, the Gamers Edition of course, he directly claims over a million people saw that show live. I cannot stress this enough. He is literally lying to Guinness about a record Guinness just gave him. I just can't fucking believe it. <laughs> I can't fucking believe it. That's all three of the records Guinness appears to have on file for Tommy Tallarico. Tommy seems to know better though. His list of awards on his website says he has four, the fourth one being most video game concerts in a year, a record I cannot find anywhere other than his list of awards and other interviews with Tommy. So I don't know, maybe he has four. Well, his biography says he currently holds five, so I don't know, the numbers just keep going up. Can he at least get the record straight on the number of records? Okay, to be fair, he has recently updated it. Lately, he started saying he has... Seven. Um, I have seven, seven Guinness World Records for, for different things. So what are all the others? You know, for a guy who, uh, let's be frank, fucking loves bragging about all the shit he's done. I've worked with everybody. I was the first American. Tommy is uncharacteristically modest about saying what these other four records are. In a Reddit AMA a few years back, he said he has seven, but just to avoid wasting people's time, he only listed three of them. Would you like to guess which three? When someone directly asks him to list the records, he sheepishly adds most game concerts in a year, but that's it. The others are like ghosts. Tommy, how many games world records do you have? Um, that's, so I have seven. Um, one of the ones I have is the most symphony shows in a single year. But I would say the th there's three big ones. The three big ones are 
most shows, biggest live show ever seen, and then the the um, the most video games. So I have a total of seven, but there's three big ones. He doesn't even have a riddle prepared for this one. He just refuses to tell people. He's so shy all of a sudden. Luckily for us, in Tommy's investor videos for the Amico, we can see at least five of them. So let's just take a look and find out for ourselves. In the center we have most prolific composer of soundtracks. Okay, can't verify he's done that many games, but we at least know that one. The two either side say most video game concerts and largest audience. Those are the three we know he has. Now for the mystery ones. To the right we have the record for the most video game concerts perf- this is the same record. This is the previous version. This one's from 2014 with 293 shows. What about the one on the left? The longest video game concert, video games live, which has performed 260. These are the same three records. It's starting to look like there's a good reason the other four records don't get mentioned much. In one house tour he gave in 2017, he has them all laid out on the floor where they appear to have sat for five years now. Look at that dust bunny. And Tommy calls them seven different Guinness World Records. There's seven of them. Uh, seven different Guinness World Records, so... I'm not sure how these can be seven different records if when you pause the video and look, several of them are the same. And I think when people get too up close and personal with his records, they start to notice this too. In this clip, he talks about two of them, ones we know, and then this weird cut happens. That was the first that one. That was the first yep. one. Yep. And then, uh, and then the, for the shows, and then the... Where's he? Be jealous. I didn't edit that in, I swear. I'd love to know what happened between these two clips. Here's yet another fun fact. Guinness charges separately for the award certificate and the plaque it comes in. They have a unique design they don't change very often, and they're pretty expensive. When Tommy got these two in 2014, it looks like he just bought two picture frames from a store. I guess when you have so many versions of the same record already, you get sick of paying full price for them. I'm not just bringing this up to make fun of him, although I am, but it's actually really useful data. You know how I mentioned Guinness renamed his most games record? In this one tour with the super awkward edit, another funny thing happens. Tommy reads out that record, right? This is a uh, Guinness world record for the person who's worked on the most video games in a lifetime. Wow. So but because he got a shitty frame for this one, we can check and see the record he's reading from says something else. For the person who's worked on the most video games in a lifetime. Wow. Tommy refuses to acknowledge the new title and pretends it has the old wrong name because it's a bit more prestigious. He's lying about the text of a record he is literally holding in his hands and pretending to read from. This guy's a fucking genius. How has he never been caught? I feel like I'm going crazy. You know how the concert records say video game concerts? If you've been paying attention, you'll notice Tommy always says it's for symphony concerts or symphonic concerts. Biggest symphony show ever seen live. The most symphony shows ever done. Uh, the biggest symphony show ever seen live. Biggest symphony show ever seen live. Tommy knows his video game concert record is extremely stupid, and out of embarrassment he calls it something else. Oh, maybe it's not deliberate, maybe he just got the name wrong. No, I can prove it. Here's a time he does that while pointing at it and pretending to read it. Here's one. Largest audience. Largest audience ever to see a uh, symphonic concert live. 752,000 people. We can see what the record says in the previous shot, Tommy. Okay, let's wrap this up. How many records does Tommy have? Through a list of games that cannot be found but keeps exploding, and by making up new definitions of concert, it looks like Tommy has about three. But he owns seven plaques of them, so he tells people he has seven different Guinness World Records. And maybe he does have a most video game concerts in a year one and it's just never visible in shots of his records. Guinness only has three records in their search, though. Well had. Um, I was gonna move on from Guinness at this point, but then there was a new development in the search for Tommy's list of games. After looking everywhere for the list of 350 plus games Tommy supposedly worked on, or I guess composed for now, we realized there was one place that would definitely have one. Guinness themselves. So we emailed them. And by we, I mean Kat did it for me, she did all the work. That's what people mean when they say we, they mean someone else did it for me. We worked on the oof sound. Yeah, right, I know this trick, Tommy. We, Kat, asked them what evidence was provided for the record and how it was verified. Guinness were really polite and got back to us very quickly. Here was their response. The record title in question is one of our consultant records, which are not open to standard applications. They are confirmed by specialist consultants that we approve. Uh. Our expert external consultants that we use for records of this kind often have professional links to the field in question, i.e. video games. 
These titles are research-based rather than evidence-based. Thanks. First off, this email provides me the incredible quote that the record is not evidence-based, which is just fantastic. Thank you very much for that. This is one of the situations where if you did the research, you would have the evidence. This doesn't require specialist consultation. It's a list of games. On top of that, this implies Guinness have never seen a list either. The record was verified by a consultant, so someone, somewhere, says Tommy has worked on this many games and Guinness believes them. But then something even stranger happened. Previously, when you typed Tommy's name into Guinness's record search, that record came up. One of the other VGL records came up because he's mentioned by name on that record, the other one doesn't. So those are the ones that came up. This is a screenshot I took in early September. Anyway, after we emailed them asking how they verified it, I realized I needed to take another screenshot because I'd scribbled all over one of them. So I went back and the record didn't come up. Just the other one did. Right after we emailed them asking them where their evidence was, and they said they didn't have it, the record disappeared. Did we... Did we just get one of Tommy's records deleted? Oh no! <laughs> I didn't mean to do this! I just wanted to see a list of games! Tommy, if you're watching this, it wasn't me, it was Cat! Please don't- so now the brakes have come off and this video is spiralling out of my control. I've lost all hope of figuring out what Tommy is doing or why. Doing the early research before this all happened, it got kind of nostalgic going back and re-watching ancient episodes of Electric Playground and reviews on the run, and watching Tommy do his wacky boobery and yell at Victor when he says normal things like Metroid Prime is fun. I was trying to remember if I ever found Tommy funny or if I was always just laughing at him, you know? Meh, meh, meh. You know what I gotta say? To you, I don't care what you think. Even doing that level of research, I fell back into an ancient drama I saw unfold as a kid and completely forgot about. Tommy's awful opinions used to be a running joke on forums discussing his show's reviews. People would bring up he gave Smash Brothers Melee, one of the most beloved games in human history, a 2.5 out of 10. It was a huge running joke. I learned about this because I was a pretty big Mega64 fan as a teenager, and they shot some videos at his house and even did an episode of their podcast there. I remember watching this on my iPod Nano on the bus. Now we're in another strange room. This was shot just as Smash Brothers Brawl had come out, and the gang made fun of his old review as well. Smash Brothers is now released. That's right. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom has gone on record saying favorite game series of all time. <laughs> There's this awful rumor on the internet, right. as, as there always is, mm -hmm. that I gave Smash Brothers like a 2.5 or something. Oh. And so the reality is, is that we we never actually reviewed Smash Brothers ever on oh. G4. Oh. So people on the internet who say that I gave Smash Brothers a low score. Yeah. Bite, no, no, no. bite him. Tommy is pointing to the giant model dinosaur he has in his garden. Anyway, it's clear this rumor really gets to him. In an IGN thread about his Mario Galaxy review, this comes up and Tommy T shows up to defend himself because he Googles his name and has nothing better to do. He claims it's not true, but refuses to say what the real score was because he thinks it's fun watching people spout nonsense. So Tommy never gave Melee a 2.5. That's just a rumor. Leave him alone. Here's Tommy's review of Smash Brothers Melee. What do you think about Super Smash Brothers Melee for the Nintendo game? GameCube. Well, you know, I gotta tell you, it's another GameCube letdown. Another GameCube disappointment in my book. Three out of ten. I give it a two and a half. He said this on TV. People saw him. The footage exists. This isn't speculation. When Tommy does something people criticize him for, even something dumb that doesn't need defending like a video game opinion, he just lies and says he never did it. Like, why would you lie about something so stupid and easy to check? I'm reaching the point where if Tommy says something, it's easier to assume he made it up. His website used to have a page of famous people seen wearing Tallarico Studios t-shirts, which is a weird thing to document in the first place. But the thing is though, Every single picture on it is photoshopped. Like, what was his goal here? What is he even trying to do? Tommy's stratospheric levels of clout chasing have hit a point where I literally can't tell if he's joking. He has a gallery page with pictures of him performing and in magazines and so on, and there's a celebrities section showing off all the cool people he's stood next to. Wow! He's really proud of some of them because he keeps reposting them. This Jamie Lee Curtis picture pops up on his Twitter when she's in the news or it's her birthday. She's a wonderful, kind, and talented human being, and a fan of my video games live show. But one of the pictures on here is really strange. 
strange. This one is of the Dalai Lama, apparently. Before the Amico situation deteriorated to the point he stepped down, he used to post on the Atari Age forums, and people were discussing the Amico's Karma Gaming Engine, a feature Tommy later admitted he made up, by the way. During the conversation about Karma, someone referenced the Dalai Lama, so of course, he reposted that picture and said he met him in London and he liked his music. The issue here is this later turned out to be a wax statue of the Dalai Lama from the Madame Tussauds in London. This is an example of what I've decided to call the Talarico event horizon. Tommy has lied so much about so many things, I can't even tell if this is meant to be a joke. Is he doing a bit? Is Tommy Talarico a CIA experiment to see how far you can get in the liberal games industry by just making shit up? Is Tommy Talarico just a shadow on the wall of a cave? I. I started making this video because I thought a sound effect was funny! I can't tell if he's joking, or if he genuinely wants to convince people he met the Dalai Lama. Like I said, this was in a conversation about an Amico feature it turned out he made up. We have something that's called our Karma Gaming Engine. And what that means is that everybody, no matter what your skill level, can feel like you have a chance and that you're in the game. I'm interested in the fact that you're using the Karma Gaming Engine. Uh, where where did that come from? Okay, so the Karma Gaming Engine is just some shit we made up. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Like he literally made it up to get people to invest and admitted it later. Everywhere you look, Tommy is trying to build more prestige in ways that make no sense. Once Tommy had fled the Atari Age forums after calling everyone a gaming racist and stepping down, people started posting about how weird he was being, and a guy told a story there about how he ran a display at the Houston Arcade Expo in 2018 showing off old Intellivision stuff, right when the Amico had just been announced. So he asked Tommy if he wanted him to put out some business cards advertising the Amico, which he did. His display won an award at the show, and when he mentioned this to Tommy, he allegedly asked him to mail him the award. If this story is true, Tommy just assumed that this award belonged to him. This is just an allegation. Normally I wouldn't bother putting this in the video, but the problem is it tracks so well with a lifetime of taking credit for things he didn't do and making up awards. I find this story too believable not to mention. Still, this doesn't mean Tommy hasn't done good work in the industry or had any legitimate achievements. To properly recognize the good work he's done, we ought to talk about Gang. The Game Audio Network Guild is a group of industry professionals dedicated to improving the craft, helping people network, and recognizing people's achievements with awards. Tommy has won a lot of awards from the Guild over the years, at least 16 by my count, and he's clearly very proud of them because he puts them all up next to his Guinness World Records. Tommy Tallarico is also the founder of Gang. Recently, uh, I founded a nonprofit organization called the Game Audio Network Guild, or Gang. It's really funny seeing Tommy give tours of his house in his Gang t-shirt and of his office with his Gang desktop background, and then going to his website and seeing 16 awards from the group he founded and was on the board of directors of at the time. Tommy Tallarico, composer and sound designer for video games, also the president of the Game Audio Network Guild, also known as Gang. Gang even gave an award for best sound library to that sound pack he made, with Joey's help. They've only given out that award four times in their 20 year existence, by the way. And again, these are award winning sound effects. At least we know the sounds in the Roblox kit really are award winning. Like at this point, research for a video that was supposed to be about the Roblox oof has gone so far off course that I needed like Something that was baseline obviously true to hang on to so I could return to sanity. So I asked myself what I thought would be the most obvious question. Was Tommy even on Cribs? On YouTube, like I said, there's a lot, there's videos of your of your house and your MTV stuff. Cribs and I was it, it, on. It, it, it's, it's awesome, right? You did it, MTV <laughs> Cribs? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, they were on my house. Didn't you have an episode of MTV Cribs back in the day? Yeah! Like he tells people it was Cribs, he uploaded a video to his YouTube channel saying it was Cribs. So was it? <laughs> no! <laughs> Cribs is, you know, a TV show. It has lists of episodes. 
You can just check. It was obviously a lie the entire time. I don't know how no one called him on it. Do gamers just not know what Cribs is? Cribs went to the home of massively successful musicians like Snoop Dogg and Maroon 5, or other really big celebrities like Tony fucking Hawk. They did not go to the home of the guy who might have made some of the skateboard sounds for his game. Absolutely no normal person watching MTV in the mid 2000s is gonna know who Thomas the Tallarico engine even is. He did the soundtrack to Earthworm Jim. He's not a celebrity. Nobody gives a shit about his fucking fountain. A waterfall here, which makes me want to pee at night, oddly enough. My mother's very proud. Cribs had very specific motion graphics, and they always showed the same factoids at the beginning every time, using the same visual. This video just has a wall of text. MTV had a very specific vibe with its backing tracks. This thing uses easily identifiable stock music. So identifiable, YouTube flagged it. But if it wasn't Cribs, then what was it? Someone in the comments says they saw this on a disc that came with a gaming magazine back in the day, but I think they're thinking of the other times he did that. Because Tommy's a mad massive narcissist, his website has a video section with a meticulous collection of his appearances, and links to them on YouTube, some of which he uploaded himself. He links this one and calls it MTV Cribs Here Too, along with two of his PlayStation Magazine appearances. But here's the thing, Tommy's website is ancient and has several much older versions preserved on the internet archive. On the version from 2004, before YouTube was a thing, he would just put the videos on his own site. Many of the videos on the old site ended up as links to YouTube videos on the new one, the PlayStation Magazine house tour and interviews are here, along with this Around the World in 80 Games thing. There doesn't seem to be a Cribs video on the old version of the site, which is a bit of a red flag. Additionally, there's one house tour that didn't seem to make it to the new one, done by Gamer TV. The video itself on Tommy's site wasn't archived, but Gamer.TV was a show from the UK about gaming hosted by Sam Delaney. One episode had a feature on ways to make money in the game industry, professional gamers, voice actors, and of course, a certain composer. Hey, I'm Tommy Tellerico, composer and sound designer for video games. Hey, wait a second. Hey, I'm Tommy Tommy Tellerico, composer and sound designer for video games. So this episode is using a cut down version of the footage we saw in Tommy's video. So now we know who really shot this footage. Gamer.tv used to have a website. Gamer.tv. Oh, that's clever. It's down now, but in archives it's clear the site used to have a video section with extra stuff. One of the extra videos appears to be about a gamer with a Ferrari and a luxury home. I think Gamer.tv met Tommy and toured his house, used clips from this in their show, and uploaded the entire house tour as a bonus feature to their website. The video linked here is sadly not archived either, at least not directly. It was preserved if, say, Tommy downloaded it and put it on his own website, and then later moved his video archive to YouTube. This is a kind of cool act of video preservation, except for the part where it somehow ended up being called MT. TV Cribs. How did that happen? I mean, the file on his website was named correctly. This would be a difficult thing to get wrong unless he did it on purpose. MTV so Cribs I was it, it, on. It, it, it's, it's awesome, right? Is Tommy just, like, a pathological liar? Does he have to lie to sound more interesting no matter what? Like how he went from saying he did some sounds for Prime to saying he worked on it with Miyamoto for five years? Or how he went from being one of the voices in Pro Skater to the audio director? Or how he went from doing three songs for Sonic and the Black Knight in 2009 to being the first American to ever get to kiss Sonic on his little mouth? Every time something comes up again, the lie has to get bigger. In that newer house tour I showed, the guy asks Tommy about if it was featured on Cribs, and he says it was on there more than once. Tommy Tallarica has invited me to his MTV crib. This has <laughs> been on the MTV Cribs, right? Uh, a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why is he like this? Why are you like this? I know you're still watching, Tommy. Explain yourself. What are you doing? What are you fucking doing? So, yeah, maybe every single thing Tommy has ever said is a lie. Maybe some of it is true, but bear in mind that even if Tommy has lied, that isn't like a crime. You can just lie to people. Watch, I am a trained helicopter pilot. 
See, you can just say things. No one can stop you. However, there are times when lying does become a crime. And Tommy would know this intimately because it cost him $100,000. In 2009, after putting on a video games live event in Brazil, Tommy returned to America with over $100,000 in cash on his person. When you enter America with more than $10,000, you have to declare it for money laundering and trafficking reasons. Tommy knew he had to do this, but for some reason he didn't. His business associate, who was also his brother, filed a customs declaration on their common behalf, denying they were bringing that much money into the country. Tommy knew this was false. When he was caught at a TSA checkpoint with a bag with a hundred grand in it, there were some serious questions. He quickly made up a story to explain himself. He told them he didn't need to declare the money because he had distributed it among his band members during the flight in amounts less than $10,000, and then took the money back once they were through customs, so no one needed to declare anything. Tommy thought he was being clever, but he had just accidentally confessed to the crime of structuring, where you deliberately avoid regulations by pulling stunts like this. Structuring is a federal felony, with huge fines and up to five years in prison attached to it. Later, he came clean and told investigators he lied and made up that story, and actually he just took the money over the border himself. So when I call Tommy a liar, that's not just my opinion. There is also a legal document signed by him admitting to it. Looking deeper into United States v. Tallarico, that's its name, Tommy pled guilty, was placed on probation for a year, forfeited the 100 $2,000 seized by customs and had to pay a $1,000 fine, plus a $25 assessment fee. America. There's a really interesting lesson here. In the game industry, you can just lie about what games you worked on, what sounds you made, and whether you worked on cribs, and the only real repercussion is people finding you unpleasant. But if you try that with the TSA while carrying a large, unexplained bag of money, there can be consequences. There are other ways lying can be a crime too. For example, if you lie to potential investors to get their money. During one of Tommy's many attempts to find investors for the Amico, he told the exact kind of Tommy esque tall tales you would expect from him, but in a situation where doing so can get you in serious trouble. In February 2021, he recorded this video for potential investors and lists the team of so called Avengers working at Intellivision, one of whom was Kara Acker, a former marketing manager at Mattel on Disney Princesses and especially Frozen, which would be a great find for the company, and thinking she was on board might well have helped convince investors to part with their money. If we scroll slightly higher on her LinkedIn though, we can see she actually left Intellivision in 2020. But here's Tommy telling people in 2021, after she was gone, he has her on board, so you should definitely invest. Our VP of global marketing used to work at Mattel as one of the global brand managers over there, right? And she was in charge of the Disney brand within Mattel, so that's a double bonus there. Um, is there a word for lying to people? for money? If this convinced people to invest, they have grounds to say they were lied to about the status of the company. You can't just pretend people still work for you. On their Republic crowdfunding campaign, which raised $11.5 million, the pitch video for these investors featured Acker heavily, in Tommy's disgusting Egypt room, as VP of Global Marketing. She was front and center as one of the intended draws to investors. She was basically the company's pharaoh. She's also still shown on the list of team members, including, ironically, a link to her link LinkedIn, which will tell you she's actually gone. This crowdfunding campaign ended in 2021. There was a period of four months minimum where people were investing based on a video and information which was not accurate at the time and never corrected. The Intellivision website listed Acker as VP of Global Marketing as late as July 2021, according to the Internet Archive. Did the guy who ran the website quit too? Investors using this website as a source of information would have a hard time confirming who was actually at the company. People don't give investors Investors don't give you millions of dollars unless you have hard, no, cold you, facts. I certainly hope there's some facts I missed here. People gave this company millions of dollars. Like seriously, I hope for Intellivision's sake, Aka just put the wrong date on her LinkedIn, or there's gonna be some questions. In fact, if you click the invest button on the Intellivision website, it takes you to the same video with Aka still in it. You know, the Avengers, right? Marvel Avengers, you know, they're the super team of superheroes ready to save the world. Also on Tommy's list of Avengers was Jay Allard, the co-founder of the X Xbox and Xbox Live. This would make the company look like it was on the right track and had some really good minds attached to it. However, Allard decided he wasn't a good fit and left the company. In 2020. Here's another one. How about the guy who co-founded and co-created 
the Xbox, right? When Tommy was saying Allard was on the team in this footage, to get people's money, Allard was already gone. He was gone to such an extent, he didn't just change his LinkedIn to say he wasn't at the company anymore, he removed it from his page completely. Allard unworked at Intellivision. And after this happened, Tommy was shooting a new video telling people he was in the Amico Avengers. I mean, this guy doesn't even need to work anymore but he loves our idea and concept so much that he joined the team and has been making huge, huge contributions. This particular comment is incredible because on another investment platform, remember Fig? Tommy had previously bragged about Allard's involvement in that investor video too. He was actually at the company when this one was made at least. And in television's share offering documents on Fig also claimed Allard was involved and that he was the global managing director. A while after Allard had left, the SEC noticed in television Fig was still advertising he was there. Investors were technically being deceived. Also, a major member of staff, like the global managing director leaving, could be causing problems with making the product they were promising to investors, you know? So, they asked Fig what was going on. Orally, someone at a government agency physically asked someone at Fig what the hell was happening at Intellivision. Fig asked Intellivision to clarify. Intellivision panicked and said they would change the documents, and product development was unaffected by his leaving because, to quote Fig quoting Intellivision, he has not played a material role in product development considering his contributions. He joined the team and has been making huge, huge contributions. Uh, this is footage of a CEO right before his company Company tells a major government agency Allard is gone and hadn't made meaningful contributions, telling people he's on the team and has been making huge, huge contributions to get their money. I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a helicopter pilot, but I don't think it gets worse than this. You know, this is the kind of thing that's like, really, I mean, talk about a slam dunk. The people working at the company are the main pitch for the Amico. Invest in me, I don't lose, I have the best team. I've been a winner in this industry my whole career. I don't lose. And what I've done is packed our team with other people who are winners. Several of his key team members weren't working there anymore when he recorded this. One of them had even scrubbed it from his LinkedIn. I don't think this is giving potential investors an accurate impression of what they're buying into. This is the exact kind of thing Tommy normally does, but in this context, it's really bad. And this brings us to the real question at the center of all this. The big thing we've been avoiding for the last hour while we circle the drain but we can't avoid it anymore. Did Tommy make the funny baby sound effect? Remember when that was the point of the video? When we look at the sum collective of all of his claims, the Tallarico totality, if you will, and we put it in context with, uh, reality, when Tommy says he created the oof, this might just be me. But I don't believe him. Although at this point, if Tommy confessed to a murder, I would assume he was just trying to be cool. I'm sure if I was a more reasonable person, I could say the evidence is all inconclusive and Tommy could have worked on the sound, maybe. But right now, all I know is Tommy is a huge liar and I hate him and he made me forget what this video is about. I promise you, when I started making this video, my goal was to make something short for once. Take a break from my longer projects to make a quick video quickly so people knew I was alive. I did not expect, while I was doing research, for a rabbit hole to open beneath my feet and to fall Wiley e. Coyote style into an abyss of lies and madness and seemingly getting one of his Guinness World Records sent to the fucking Shadow Realm. I didn't choose this, this happened to me and I'm not happy about it. I wanted this to be a story about how, in our modern age, we don't take ownership of artists' work seriously enough through the lens of a sound effect that had been reused without credit for over a decade. But the people People not being credited in this story are the hardworking folks under Tommy who he has taken credit from over the years and the original voice actor, none of whom will see any of the money Tommy makes from selling their sound today. It is incredibly easy for hard work to be exploited by corporations, and one of those corporations happens to be called Tommy Tallarico Studios Incorporated. But that's really a structural problem, and we already all know capitalism is bad. Statistically, your most formative memories are of a global financial crisis. You don't need that lecture from me. I think the unique lesson of this story is about, well, records in multiple senses of the word. What's really at stake here is history, how these events and people will be remembered. Tommy has cultivated such a reputation that when I asked about the origins of a famous punch sound effect on Twitter, someone independently brought him up and said they assume he must have done it. He seems to have done everything. 
At least he says he has. The man has successfully inserted himself into conversations about sound effects he didn't even make, while the people who did the work attributed to him evaporate into namelessness. No one knows who Joey Kouris is, and he made the sound effects people think Tommy did. He worked on fucking Fortnite. I've heard his sound effects as they blast my Silver Surfer into dust. It's not right for him and people like him to be forgotten. Games have always had problems crediting authors correctly. Early games were seen as products first and creative works second, so credit wasn't taken seriously. Creators used to not be allowed to put their name on the game and had to hide them in easter eggs. Mark Cerny, ironically another good candidate for first American to work on Sonic, wasn't allowed to keep any of his work or design documents when he was working at Atari, and his games were considered Atari creations, not his. His source code, notes, and documentation were only preserved because someone got them out of a dumpster when Atari closed the office and threw it all out. This problem has especially contributed to the perception of women working in games. Yoko Shimomura, one of the most well-known video game music composers today, a veritable industry icon one might say, composed all but three of the tracks on the original arcade version of Street Fighter 2. But due to Capcom's crediting policy at the time, she was credited via a pseudonym. For her music's appearance on console releases and updated versions of the game, she was not credited for her compositions at all. All credit was given to the people who translated them to the new formats. Her contributions to game music history are only recognized properly decades afterwards, because her early career was rendered invisible, music she wrote often being credited to someone else. This was widespread at the company. The Capcom sound team throughout the 80s and early 90s was almost entirely women. Just think about that for a second. An extremely influential group of female early game composers, all credited through pseudonyms, or sometimes not at all, and with the ports of music they composed credited to someone else. Maybe one of the reasons game development is perceived as a male-dominated industry is because all the women who've always been here keep getting left out of the history they wrote. If you're interested in the topic, I recommend The Street Fighter Lady and Female Credit by Andy Lemon and Hilagonda Rietveld. I've linked them in the description and plagiarized them heavily in this section of the video. But even when people are credited, the recognition can easily be minimized. Joey did some of the music for the Terminator Sega CD game, but as you can imagine, this information has been rendered obscure thanks to a much larger musician making sure his name is remembered first. The official CD release of the soundtrack has Tommy V. Tallarico stamped on the front. Its booklet says composed produced and performed by Tommy Tellerico, and calls Tommy a veritable video game industry icon, of course. The half a dozen people who collaborated with him and wrote the other half of the songs only appear on the back of the case, at the bottom, as footnotes with stars corresponding to which songs they actually made. So their names don't get noticed quite as much. Joey's song was so good, Tommy saw fit to put it on another album with his name and face on it, Tommy Tellerico Virgin Games Greatest Hits. Joey's name is even smaller on the back of this one. It's not difficult to see why Joey's contributions to game history are being forgotten. Reuploads of the full Terminator CD soundtrack onto YouTube just say, composed by Tommy, there's a reupload of specifically Joey's song too. The uploader, who understandably missed the tiny note on the back of the CD case, credits it to Tommy. The top comment is a guy called Joey Kouros, explaining that he actually made it, but also thanking people for their kind words. We're at the point the actual composers have to explain they made the song in the comments of re-uploads of their work misattributed to their old boss. This extends back into the regular music industry as a whole, of course, but also into material we covered here. Michael Jackson's long-rumoured, now semi-confirmed, work on Sonic 3 isn't all it's cracked up to be either. Like a certain other composer, Michael had people who worked for him. According to Brad Buxer, an American keyboardist and composer who did a lot of work with Jackson, and actually is credited on Sonic 3, Jackson basically made him do most of it. Once you're well enough established, it only gets easier to exploit the talents of people working for you and build up your own status on the back of something you made someone else do. The industry is still constructed in a way that treats individual creators, usually the biggest names on the project, as the true authors, attributing a game's success to them and not the many people who did the work. Things are so bad even the recipients of this praise have called it out. To quote one of the worst articles ever written, there's a tendency among the to attribute the creation of a game to a single person, says Warren Spector, creator of Thief and Deus Ex. The journalistic attitude to credit in gaming used to be so awful, it's not even clear who wrote this. The article is credited to IGN staff. Basically all success and appreciation pours directly into selected industry figureheads, even when they're actively trying to stop it from happening. And a lot of them aren't, because even if it's a problem, it's a problem that benefits them. You can tell a lot about an industry by how it treats the people who actually do the work. In terms of the scope of time, the 
average game developer is fucked. The hundreds and sometimes thousands of people who work on games now throw away years of their lives, and so many of them go completely unappreciated. Meanwhile, the most assholish men in the industry continue to promote themselves off the back of the efforts of the people working for them. Imagine making great sound effects for years and years, only for your boss to tell some guy in a Halloween mask on a livestream with a hundred views that he did it. We don't recognize the work and achievements of people who make games. We recognize the people who exploited that work the best. It's it's so easy for history and credit to get wiped away. Case in point, we could have never learned that the oof was from Messiah and assumed Roblox made it forever. But it's not even the Roblox oof. In my household, we call it the Messiah oof. There are thousands of people whose good work on games will never be properly credited, who we might have already forgotten about. Gaming is still a young medium, but already the sands of our history are spilling through our monster energy sodden fingers. Entire games are at risk of being forgotten, never mind the human beings who created them. The most valuable contribution Tommy has made to the story is mentioning that the voice actress was the daughter of someone who worked at Shiny Entertainment at the time. Her father worked at Shiny Entertainment. The girl whose voice was the oof would be close to 30 now. She might even have heard it and not even known it was her. She might not even remember recording it. The people who know who this was, and the parent who worked on the game, those people aren't going to be around forever. We have a limited time to learn who this was. The thing about history is, it happens, and then it's gone. If we don't work to preserve it, eventually it becomes impossible. To quote a famous Nintendo quit screen, everything not saved will be lost. And just as a kicker how hard it is to remember things accurately, the popularized version of the quote is wrong. It's actually anything not saved. I'm not trying to be a pedant for once. It's kind of poignant how easy it is for things to shift like that. If we don't set a precedent of taking people's work and the accuracy of records of who did what seriously, we leave it to the liars and opportunists of the world to make up that history, to the spin-off of a beer company to tell us who did what. And it honestly, on a spiritual level, fills me with immense grief thinking about the people who made the things I care about dying unrecognized for what they did and being forgotten. Gaming is just old enough that we're losing that first generation. Tommy got the rights to Intellivision because he bought them from the estate of its last president when he passed away. The name, the branding, it's his now. The original Intellivision YouTube channel, with some of the final appearances of its former president, one of the world's first ever game designers, along with the original Intellivision website with its beautiful web 1.0 history of the company, are now relegated to obscurity under another the name, while Tommy continues to use that name to advertise a product that doesn't even exist. The damage to a history people are at real risk of forgetting, whose main characters are dying, might already have been done. What history will look like 20, 30, 100 years in the future is being decided now. Now is the time to decide if Tommy Tallarico made the oof for Roblox, or if Joey Kouros made it for Messiah. And Tommy has already put his finger on the scale, decided how he wants all this to be remembered. If you buy his new sound pack, the metadata in the Roblox oof has been changed to say Tommy Tallarico. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. That's a quote commonly attributed to Winston Churchill, but he was actually probably paraphrasing George Santayana. That was me being a pedant. Old habits die hard. But here's a corollary I came up with all by myself. Those who let hucksters write the history they're trying to learn from are doomed in some other horrible way. And, for one, I don't think history gets to be written by a guy who wasn't even on Cribs. It wasn't even Cribs! <laughs>for watching this 30 minute video and accompanying feature length meltdown. The boom mic is slowly uh, peeking into frame. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching all of this and uh, I hope you had a good time and I hope to see you again soon <laughs> for once.
When I bought this uh, gamer's edition on eBay, you know, when I was flipping through it, a bookmark fell out. This is a bookmark for Alexander. Well done for all your hard work in year two this year from Miss Dunn. Goodbye. So Alexander, uh, I have no idea who you are or where you are now or if you'll ever watch this video. Um, I hope you made Miss Dunn proud. I have no idea how old you are now. This book came out in like 2008. I'm not going to do the maths on that. Um, but if you want your bookmark back, email me and I'll happily send it to you. Please do email me, in fact, because I can't throw this out. Like, that would be wrong. So this is just going to be in my life forever until someone claims it. So please take this back.